Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Desonier. I'm an engineer at Google, and I work on building the Linux kernel with LLVM. And today, I want to teach you a little bit more about how you can get started uh, debugging LLVM. So I put together this quick kind of tutorial. Uh, by no means, at the end of it, will you be an expert in LLVM, but certainly you'll have a better idea of where to look for things if something goes wrong, um, kind of where in the tree certain things are responsible for what, and, uh, and really shouldn't be afraid anymore at that point to kind of debug the compiler itself. Kind of thing. So as a quick background, um, this is kind of the uh, high level architecture diagram. This is from an excellent book series is called Architecture of Open Source. There, was a, there were at least three, I think, and kind of each chapter is interesting, talks about high level, um, what are the different, um, what are the different designs of various open source projects? And so LLVM has a chapter in there, um, but the idea is basically, if you had an abstract IR um, that that different language front ends could translate into, then you could do all your traditional compiler optimizations in that IR. Um, and from there, you could then implement separate kind of backends as pieces. And what's nice about this is when a new ISA comes along, they only have to really worry about an edge out of the, the optimizer here. Or if there's a new language that comes along, they only really have to worry about uh, generating LLVM IR. They don't have to build out a complete pipeline, which is really nice. And uh, I think, you know, MLIR changes this, makes this even more interesting, but I'm not going to be covering that today. Um, from there, I have some, some other architecture kind of diagrams that the way that I think of things. So um, the way that I think of, of these things within Clang uh, which is the C and C++ front end that I'm, I'm most interested in for my line of work. Um, things are kind of split up. We have what's called the driver, kind of provides a lot of GCC command line um, compatibility, but I believe MSVC com compatibility as well. It does a lot of kind of string to string translations of various options, but that's where you'll typically find, for instance, the main function. Um, but from there, some interesting parts, if you're familiar with, with kind of the compiler pipeline, it's um, most, most of the whole tool chain is, is effectively a pipeline. So uh, we have the preprocessor, the lexer, um, parsing in some type inference. So type inference is kind of split up between two different places in, in Clang. Um, so there's Clang lib parse and Clang lib, lib AST. So if I recall correctly, things like auto and C11 um, are actually. Uh, that type information is deduced while parsing the AST. Um, and then there's other, uh, other type inference that occurs within Clang in different parts. So I think um, template instantiation has its own rules for type deduction for the template parameters. Um, so SEMA is, is a relatively large part of the tree is where semantic analysis occurs, uh, where we do checks for, um, you know, we have code if we've gotten this far, we have code that's already been lexed and parsed correctly, but it may still be ambiguous. Um, we may emit diagnostics, which can be warnings or, or errors. Um, but, uh, and then for some of the template instantiation stuff, a lot of that is kind of cloning of AST nodes. And from there, Clang will do a uh, walk of the abstract syntax tree that it's built and emit IR. So there's a whole bunch of these Clang lib code gen, code gen module, code gen function, you know, all these different classes and source files kind of work together um, to eventually emit LLVM IR, right? And so a lot of these um, underneath below, I've kind of listed, you know, where in the tree you might uh, look to find the kind of source files for some of these things. And you'll notice a lot of implementations are under Clang lib. Uh, and then a lot of headers will be under uh, Clang include Clang and then uh, kind of matching the, the source file layout. But um, then when it comes to generating instructions, uh, instructions in, or when we think about LLVM IR from a in-memory representation, uh, we start off with the notion of a module. And a module is really, um, you know, what's our maybe translation unit, but uh, it gets, things get a little fuzzy when you start doing LTO, for instance. LTO, suddenly now your whole program is, is becomes like a module, right? And a module typically has one-to-many functions, right? So you kind of see this repetition here of multiple functions. Each function 
can have one to many basic blocks. Basic block is essentially a straight line sequence of procedural code that is terminated by a, uh, a some form of control flow typically. So you'll typically have one to many instructions in a basic block where the final instruction is considered a terminal or a terminator instruction. Um, so typically you can imagine almost like edges from the final instruction from out of one basic block into another kind of thing. So conceptually, you know, this is how, these are the classes as well in the LLVM namespace. That's important to know. Uh, and we'll take a look at what the IR, the textual representation looks like as well, but LLVM has basically this, this triangular representation of IR. It has this in-memory representation. It has um, a textual on-disk representation. That's what we typically write a lot of the human readable uh, and writable unit tests in. And then also uh, a compact binary serial serialized form on disk. So now if we take a look at the back end, and again, this is a very high level overview. There's lots of stuff missing here kind of thing, but kind of targeting some of the, the more interesting things I find is, you know, the both the, what we consider maybe the middle um, optimizations, the generic optimizations, uh, but also the machine specific code gen both live within the LLVM subdirectory. Uh, so within within the, the, the middle, uh, all the kind of, language agnostic or machine agnostic optimization passes, it's very common to have passes broken up into kind of multiple uh, maybe pieces, right? So for instance, if we just take a look at one, which would be the inliner, uh, it's split up into three real pieces, at least three real pieces. So there's uh, analysis is, uh, can I or should I do this transformation, inline substitution, transform, is very high level decision making about pulling in the analysis and, and making decisions from that. And then within utils, for instance, you'll actually see a function where, you know, it's been told go and in, perform the inline substitution. So it has all the machinery for um, kind of undoing the calling convention and the return values and, and moving the body of that in line. So it's very common to see these working together. Um, new pass manager uh, allows us to better uh, more easily invalidate some of the analyses passes. Um, but what's interesting about opt is it's LLVM IR in and LLVM IR out. And from there in the back end, there's actually two other uh, kind of intermediary representations that, that we'll see uh, that, that we'll get to here. Um, so what's interesting is there's in the back end is there's kind of machine generic code under LLVM lib code gen, but then also machine specific uh, lowering passes under LLVM lib target, and then typically the ISA would be another subdirectory. And there's many, many passes here, uh, but I think two of the, the larger, more interesting ones that we'll take a look at are instruction selection and register allocation. So as of the time of this video, LLVM has three instruction selectors where selection DAG is kind of the older one. Um, typically has a lot of probably more optimizations implemented here than some of the other ones, but uh, you'll typically see this interface defined in LLVM include LLVM code gen selection DAG icell.h, and then you'll see individual ISA specific implementations under LLVM lib target and then the ISA. But then there's later there was fast icell is more of maybe, you know, I'm more interested in the dash O zero use case, or I'm doing a bunch of um, edit, compile, link, debug steps really quickly. I don't care about doing full optimizations, fast ICEL. Um, and since then, global ICEL tries to break up. I think one of the major criticisms of, of selection DAG is that LLVM IR is in uh, a form called SSA form, and it gets converted into a, a, a DAG, a directed, directed acyclic graph for selection DAG, but then ends up getting converted back into SSA form later for some of the, the other IRs. So global ISL tries to avoid uh, converting the representation repeatedly, but also I think pipelines some of the transforms a, a little better. But from, from there, after instruction DAG, that's where we see our kind of next IR is called Mirror. It's a separate class LLVM machine instar. 
Um, the machine instant passes are architect are ordered and can can be is is where things start to look a little bit more architecture specific. So from there, register alloc allocation is another major pass in the back end. Right now, LLVM has four different register allocators. Um, depending on your constraints of your environment, you can choose to maybe use a faster register allocator or um, maybe a more uh, greedy one that will take the time to compute very precise live range intervals. Um, but from there, after register allocation, you know, there's m multiple passes kind of in between and before and after these kind of the, the only two I think are most interesting to call out. But, um, you know, eventually we get to uh, a class called ASM printer. And ASM printer, I think of it more so as an assembler where pretty much from here we see the third and final IR in the compiler is, is we call this the MC layer. It's LLVM MC inst class. And from here, MC streamer will defer to two different subclasses based on what are, your, what, what are you trying to generate? So in most cases, we're trying to generate object files. MC object streamer will package up. Uh, it, it will encode all the instructions that we've selected and generated based on our object file format for our different platforms. Otherwise, if we want textual assembly, MC asm streamer, basically we'll just call printf on a bunch of objects in, in memory kind of thing. So um, those are some of the, I think, more interesting classes of, of LLVM of where you can take a look for if you suspect certain bugs kind of thing. Now, how do I build LLVM? I think this is, this is a little interesting and there's some caveats here. So this is you know, straight from my shell history, exactly what I run. And, you know, we'll, we'll cover in detail what all these are, but I think from the slides, this will be posted for reference later. But um, I think the first most important thing is uh, I, I use CMake to configure the builds and then Ninja to, to invoke the builds, but I do a lot of release builds mostly. Um, there's a couple different options here. This isn't specific to LLVM. You could say uh, the CMake build type is debug and then you get all your debug symbols. Even release builds will have some debug info. It's gonna be minimum line tables, which is enough to print function stack frame, like the name of functions when unwinding should the compiler itself uh, have to terminate execution, for instance. Um, uh, and then another generic CMake flag is I have to do builds with Ninja. Uh, I think there are some interesting kernel changes recently to make uh, makes make a little bit quicker, but in my experience, I've always uh, had success with Ninja. Um, I like to bootstrap Clang with Clang. So you can say dash D C make C compiler equals, and then a path to another Clang binary, and then a path to a Clang plus plus binary. What's interesting to me is every once in a while, I'll do a build with GCC and G plus plus, and you'll see that maybe not as many upstream developers have been doing that as well, because newer builds with GCC will find uh, call out issues in, in the LLVM source. Um, then one of the things I find, at least on my system, is that linking Clang itself with LLD is significantly faster than BFD, uh, can take advantage of multiple cores on my, my workstation, which is very nice. So I recommend that. Um, then for, you need to enable specifically certain projects in LLVM to, to build them by default. So Clang and LLD are the most interesting to me. Uh, those are, Typically, I only really build these two, and I don't always build compiler RT. I typically will build compiler RT if I want my um, sanitizer runtimes. Otherwise, you'll typically see a bunch of kind of linkage failures uh, when trying to build uh, binaries with these. If you're building C++ binaries, you'll probably want libcxx. And you know, there, there's lots of projects in the tree. But really, for me, building kernels, these are the only two projects I really need. Um, this is kind of an anti-pattern, but I find this significantly speeds up my builds is, you know, if I'm only gonna be doing a lot of testing with certain backends, I'll enable them explicitly. I believe if you leave this flag out, um, they'll all, all non-experimental backends will be enabled in LLVM. One of the things that's a little tricky is, you know, I'll typically configure my builds to only support a few backends just to speed up builds, but then I'll go to do like a PowerPC build and I'll get kind of bizarro failures from Clang because it's complaining it doesn't have the backend enabled. 
kind of thing. So double-edged sword there. Um, but you can always check this by, I find if you invoke LLC with the dash dash version flag, it'll print out which backends it was configured with, right? So, so that can kind of help you triple check, like a sanity check in your environment. Um, LLVM is full of assertions. So one of the things that's kind of interesting, uh, I believe this is the default case is to turn it off. I, I kind of specify it explicitly so I can check in my shell history, what's the latest build that I did. Um, but if you're starting to look into a compiler crash, one of the things that can be very interesting and a very quick test is to redo a build with this um, turned on. And it's very common that this can help you catch various invariants that have been violated in the in the compiler itself kind of thing. So it can be useful to turn this on real quick and, and redo a build of whatever you're doing. Um, and then finally, uh, one of the things that's interesting is Ninja can have multiple targets, generally has really good um, tab completion support. So one of the things, if, I'm, if I know I'm debugging an issue in Clang, instead of just running Ninja to rebuild all of the targets by default, uh, I may speed up my compile edit debug cycled by just rebuilding Clang itself. So nin invoking Ninja Clang as, as opposed to Ninja. Okay. So again, some of these are, are a little tricky, but there's just tips that I use to, to speed up my workflows. Um, so then some of these flags I'm going to cover, uh, a lot of these can be learned by just reading through some of the, the tests within Clang and LLVM, but um, kind of important compiler generic flags for C and C++ code. Um, we have dash E is going to just invoke the preprocessor and kind of stop afterwards. Uh, pretty common convention to, to write this to a file that has a dot I suffix um, so that other tool chains will understand they may not need to run, rerun the C preprocessor. Uh, dash capital S will be stopped before assembling and produce a dot S file. Uh, dot dash lowercase C will stop before linking, produces object files, won't invoke the linker. Dash V will print the commands executed in run, some more verbose um, kind of flag for invoking the compiler. Dash pound 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 is very similar to dash V where it's gonna print the commands it, it would execute, but it actually doesn't then proceed to execute any of them. So that can be useful for checking things about your environment as well. And finally, I find dash O dash super useful for all the tools I'm gonna to talk about is if I don't wanna write the output to a file, if I just wanna pipe it into less, or see it once, you know, I'll write it to stood out instead of to a file. Um, so a lot of the examples I'm gonna go through are based on this loop here, right? So you can see we have kind of this loop where it takes, you know, a pointer that maybe decayed from an array um, and we don't really have a size on it, which is maybe a problem here, but uh, we're gonna add two numbers together in a loop uh, and, and add, you know, for the next hundred elements of, of this array here, uh, store the result there. So for instance, if we run dash E, we're gonna see a bunch of output from the preprocessor. So we'll have a bunch of um, information that is used for determining, uh, for diagnostics, which header they came from. We might we might ignore warnings, for instance, if they come from system headers, if a user can't, can't modify them. But you can see std def is actually pretty small, just defines a couple things here, um, but didn't really change our, our output other than the pound include. Um, if I enable optimizations and say dump some assembly here, you'll see, you know, I compiled this in C++ mode. So we have some name mangling going on based on the, the function signature in case we needed to, to overload that function signature. Um, and you can see here, uh, we took advantage of SSC2 instructions. And uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but kind of fully unrolled the loop here. If we wanna debug our environment here, you can see uh, because I didn't set some other flags, both when configuring Clang and when invoking the build, it's gonna use my system linker, which on my Linux distribution is gonna be um, BFD kind of thing. So if I wanna use LLD, I'll need to either use dash F use LD equals LLD, or there's another config option, CMake option you can pass to Clang to say default to LLD. Um, or dash V would print some of similar information. It actually prints a little bit more. So if it if the build falls back to anything from bin utils, uh, it, it's gonna, Clang will try to look up based on some conventions for various Linux distros where it might find these things. Um, 
It'll tell you more about where it's searching your include paths in case you're missing any dash capital I flags. Um, and then it will invoke the, you know, the linker kind of thing. So, and then a really common issue we run into, especially when testing for hermeticity of build environments is we want to kind of verify, you know, was a binary built with, with Clang or GCC or not? So I actually find using Redelf, particularly um, LLVM's distribution of it, and using the string dump of the comment section, uh, both Clang and LLD will write kind of metadata into a binary that it was built with Clang and, and LLD, which can be pretty useful. Um, now getting into more Clang specific flags. So these flags aren't gonna be you know, portable across tool chains as much as those previous ones were. Um, so some of the ones I find interesting or useful, you can say dash X Clang will be um, kind of the argument that follows is specific to Clang itself. And you can say dump tokens, for instance, if you wanna see you know, what's, what's the Lexer doing, kind of chewing up, tokenizing everything. But there's actually a whole bunch of these interesting flags. So if you say dash X Clang dash help, it will print kind of the list. So for instance, one of the ones I found interesting is if you say dash X Clang dash HTML, Clang can actually write out an HTML file of your source code, which I think is, is pretty cool. That's pretty interesting to me. Um, another one that I, I use a lot actually that I find very useful is dash X Clang dash AST dump. Um, what's interesting is Clang has types that very clearly match terminology that's used in the various langu ISO language specifications. Um, so I think that, that can be interesting, especially some of the trickier rules around implicit um, conversions and promotions. Typically you'll see at parse time, that's where Clang will insert a bunch of these. So you can see these implicit cast expert um, nodes in the tree. Um, these are more L value to R value casts, but if we had integer promotions going on, uh, they would show up as implicit cast expert nodes in the AST. Um, but you can see, you know, this is our, our loop function that we had earlier, kind of blown up. Um, you can also, uh, one of the things I find helpful sometimes is, is viewing this as a um, dot file. So you say dash X clang dash AST view. Some caveats there are you need to install some dependencies. Uh, you need to do a debug build, not a release build. And in my experience, this is been a little broken for large inputs. Um, so your mileage may vary. I generally find the textual output to work a little better kind of thing, but you know, give this a shot. It's kind of useful. Um, now, a major topic that is super important to cover is how do I dump LLVMIR, right? So I started with some source language, um, but you'll notice a lot of tests will either test the front end language generates a specific form of IR or some op test might test that IR looks like this uh, after running some pass, or a backend test may start with LLVM IR. Um, so really getting, getting a, emitting that LLVM IR is a really important topic. So um, here's a whole bunch of flags I might use day to day when I'm dumping LLVM IR. So just to go, walk through these one by one, um, emit LLVM IR is what you're gonna need at the bare minimum to produce LLVMIR instead of any of the other outputs we covered previously. Um, what's important for this is typically you're gonna wanna mix the dash S flag um, and this will emit a .ll file is the human readable form of LLVMIR kind of shown below for our loop here, uh, our for loop that we had earlier. So you can see kind of loading the X and Y parameters that were passed in um, the loop condition, the loop body the post increment, and then a, a tail exiting. Um, the rest of these aren't, aren't really necessary, but I do find them pretty nice and I do use them pretty often. So again, dash O dash is print as stood out. If I don't really wanna keep the file around, if I just am debugging quickly and wanna see what's going on, um, dash F no discard value names is pretty interesting. So if I didn't use that below here, instead of having, instead of keeping the identifiers from the source code, these would be like percent zero, percent one, percent two, and then instead of entry here, um, that might be an implicit label and this might be like percent three, um, for instance. So it keeps identifiers in the source of the LVMIR that came from the, the input source, which is pretty helpful, I find, um, at least for trying to map, keep the mental mapping from LVMIR from the input language. Um, and finally, if I'm not debugging debug info, I don't need debug info, um, 
I find that some of the debug info can kind of clutter up the IR. So I might use G0 to not emit any debug info kind of thing. Um, your mileage may vary. And you know, there's stuff in here that we can cut out too for reproducers, but we'll cover that later. Um, but one of the things that, that's a really critical point is um, when you're debugging LLVM, uh, you may, there, there may be a bug in the, the middle optimizations or there may be a bug in the back end. And having a good intuition for these is something you'll build, build up over time. But one of the things that, that you might want to check actually is if you, if you do a build with um, O2, as I showed you previously, you may find that the emitted IR already contains the bug that you're looking for. And if that's the case, then typically the bug is in the middle end. And so one of the things we want to do is we want to dump the IR from our front end, but we don't want to run the optimization passes. So typically the incantation you'll want to use is O2 X Clang disable LLVM passes. You know, big thanks to Craig Topper, LLVM's x86 backend maintainer taught me this, but very, very important. I use this very, very often. Um, and the reason why you would use this instead of um, it, like if you were to use, there's an issue with just running these, these two on their own. It b basically is, it's almost equivalent to O0 or if you had these, these two with O0 is the IR, Clang's gonna emit the IR with this function attribute called op none. And op none basically will tell the, the optimizer to never run any optimizations. So if you go to try to like dump IR that hasn't been optimized, um, but it has the op none attribute and you try to optimize it, you won't see anything happen and you'll think something's wrong. So typically you need O2 to prevent the emission of op none. Um, so you're kind of gonna, you're, you're kind of gonna want all three of these together. Um, and, and that's really important. If you ever find yourself running opt and it seems like nothing's happening, triple check for that op none attribute. It's really annoying. Probably could only emit that at O0, but I don't know, might be contentious. Um, so for instance here, uh, you can see I have xclang dash disable LLVM passes and I guess technically this should have an op, opt none on it. So I don't know if it's uh, if it's in here, but uh, otherwise uh, we might want op none, right? So the same same output now. Oh, so right, this is comparing uh, without optimizations versus with optimizations, right? So um, there's no O2 on this invocation. We've disabled our LLVM passes, and you can see here, you know, our entry, our for loop condition. Um, information about the lifetime of the condition variables. Uh, the loop body here, you'll see, does some work to do loads and address computations, and then does the write back of the, does the addition and uh, the write back into the, the array. Um, and, but if we rerun this with optimizations enabled, you'll notice that a bunch of the work, uh, you know, the, the whole function looks a little different now. This is, now the loop's been fully unrolled and it's been vectorized um, kind of thing. So that, that's kind of the difference is, you know, if I, maybe I would first try this build and if I didn't see a bug here in this generated code, then I might suspect a bug in the back end. Um, otherwise, uh, if, if this already looked like it had an issue, I might try to dump the code unoptimized first. Um, so I'd say O2, but I would disable the LLVM passes um, and then from there, I would invoke opt to try to see what, what the bug is. Um, so, you know, I was kind of getting ahead of myself referencing opt, but opt is a command line utility that'll let us invoke the kind of middle end transforms. So it's going to expect LLVMIR in and it's going to output LLVMIR. So you're, I feel, I find myself always running it with dash S. Otherwise it's going to try to generate um, the binary form and write it to stood out and instead it'll generally print a, a warning. Um, so one of the things I find useful, especially when writing, like handwriting LLVMIR for a unit test is running the verification pass. So there's a verifier pass. This will tell you whether or not your IR is valid. There's various invariants and it, it'll do a bunch of bunch of checks to make sure um, passes haven't messed things up, but it's also super useful for telling you, um, you know, if, if I hand wrote this, ran the verifier in it, 
it failed, then there's I need to go back and, and check my IR. Um, otherwise, it'll print just it out if everything was fine. Um, but if you want to just run, you know, every pass it has, O2, maybe O3, more aggressive. Um, one of the things that's interesting is you can rerun the verifier between each pass, which is pretty nice. You can say dash verify each. It's not the default behavior of most pass pipelines, um, but can be helpful for kind of catching bugs quickly. So for instance, here, if th th you can kind of think of, you know, if I was going to run Clang and I was going to emit LOVMIR and I was going to not emit op none, but I was going to disable optimization passes, theoretically, I should be able to run opt dash O2 and have that match the output um, from just running Clang O2 on its own in generating an object file. Um, the thing is front ends can have different pass pipelines. All the passes, you can kind of chain them together in pipelines and then you can chain pipelines themselves. Um, there's a way of printing this kind of thing. Uh, they won't precisely match, but um, you know, generally this is a this is pretty good for um, if I need to debug Clang is, is I'll kind of emit unoptimized IR and then start playing with opt. I generally find that faster to start debugging things. And then with opt, what's interesting is we can start running individual passes um, just with opt. So instead of running all passes or just the verifier, um, for instance, I can run loop invariant code motion. So that's a pass where if there's some expression within the body of a loop that is constant throughout the loop, uh, it might be interesting to kind of pre-compute this value uh, before entering the loop body and then doing less work in the loop overall. So for instance, if you remember back to our unoptimized loop, our unoptimized IR, the loop body was pretty big, right? So it, it does this load of, of X and Y, and then does the addition, does an address computation for where to write into the array, um, adds and then jumps to the, the kind of post loop increment. And if we run that opt with the loop invariant code motion flag, it's gonna run that pass and you'll see afterwards uh, the body is is pretty compact here. It just does um, this gap and 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 stores the result of an ad you know, where the the ad's been hoisted out of out of the loop, which is nice. So to spot where something's gone wrong in opt, you know, there's what what's nice is you can typically what I'll do is I'll run dash print after all, and I'll kind of run all the passes. So this will dump, you know, all of the passes that that get run here, and in between it'll print. Uh, the, the code as it's being transformed. So I, I typically will pipe this into less and then use slash to search and kind of jump through and see, you know, where does something disappear or where maybe it shouldn't or, you know, where, where, which, which pass should I suspect that something's going wrong in, for instance. Um, one of the things that I find a little tricky in subtle is print after all will not print a pass if it did no modification. Um, you know, maybe that can get cleaned up or fixed, but um, there's also print before all, and there's some other flags as well. So you can use pr print before all, print after all together to kind of see, you know, what did a module look like before and after a, a transform. And we'll cover more flags too. But um, from there, LLC is another command line utility when you do a build of LLVM um, that will let you play with code gen and kind of the back end, right? So given an LL file, you can use LLC to generate a .s file. Um, if you give it the dash file type equals obj flag, you can get a .o flag based on your um, host target triple. And there's other flags you can give it if you want to kind of cross uh, assemble, I guess. Um, and, you know, it has a similar print after all flag, which will show you all of the different passes it runs. Some of these are going to be the generic passes. Some of these are going to be obviously, you know, very ISO specific kind of thing. But within here, you know, you'll see, you know, all kinds of instructions here, uh, sorry, passes here, but um, five interval analysis is, will be part of your, your register inst instruction, but uh, sorry, part of register application, but you'll see things like iCell going on here. Um, you know, all these kind of work together here to do register allocation, at least for the greedy register allocator. Um, prologue, epilogue, insertion, right? If you're familiar with calling conventions, right? And, and this is kind of the order that they're all 
all run in, at least for x86 backend with a bunch of op optimizations enabled. Um, if you run dash debug pass equals structure, this will print kind of the pipeline here. So you can see how these are all kind of chained together. The indentation shows how um, these all kind of work together, what order things are run in. Oops. And I won't go too deep into iCell or register allocation, you know, very deep talk topics, interesting talks you can find online about those. Uh, but one of the things I'll note that I think is kind of interesting. So kind of before iCell, we have LVMIR and after is where we have Mirror, is where Mirror starts. And in Mirror, Mirror, one of the key things about Mirror is it's not no longer becomes order independent like opt um, passes are. Uh, with opt, you can get into issues where the ordering of passes is important and you'll get differing output depending on which order you run things in. Um, but mirror, typically you'll need to run passes in very specific order, um, which is a little tricky. But with with mirror, um, kind of after ISEL, what's interesting is we'll have a mix of both concrete registers from our ISA. If you're familiar with the calling convention, for instance, um, that's where you typically see concrete registers after post ISEL. Um, and you also see concrete registers used if you have inline ASM where, or um, variables that have register uh, kind of lifetimes, I guess, um, or register storage, I guess maybe it's more precise. Um, but then also you'll see a mix of virtual registers as well. So you'll see concrete registers and virtual registers. And later after register allocation, kind of post register allocation, is uh, you'll strictly have concrete registers. There shouldn't be any more virtual registers. Um, and then things like, if you're familiar with instruction scheduling, scheduling will happen kind of pre and post register allocation. Um, so one of the things I find myself doing a lot when debugging LLVM is I do a lot of printf debugging. You know, I'll cover more why, but um, some of the more interesting uh, Output streams to, to be aware of in LLVM is outs, errors, and debugs. These are both in the LLVM namespace. So if you're trying to use these in Clang, make sure you're using the right namespace. And you may need to include this header if you get um, definition errors. But typically, you can just stream an object's representation to them. Um, if an object has a print method, you can print to one of the streams. Um, typically, methods will have a uh, objects will have a dump method. You can just invoke those, and that should print to errors. Um, they may, I, in my experience, not all objects have dump functions, which is a little tricky and frustrating sometimes. And sometimes you may need a debug build for the dump method to be defined. But excuse me, can depend per object. Um, otherwise, one of the things that's interesting is if you want to start doing kind of per pass debugging. Uh, one of the common patterns is to include this header and define a debug type. So earlier when I showed you that LICM for the loop invariant code motion, within that pass, they define this debug type to be LICM. And then a really common pattern here is to wrap streaming to the debugs object into this LLVM debug. And then as we'll see, that lets you debug just an individual pass. Um, so um, rather than having a ton of output, we can kind of have per pass output when debugging, which is really nice. So if we take a look, for instance, at loop invariant code motion, this is kind of the, the, the beginning of the file. Um, so they, they pound define debug type, and then they have these statistics um, that take advantage of this debug type. You know, these macros kind of expand to use these things. But what's interesting is now with opt, if I invoke just that pass, but I say debug only loop invariant code motion, it's gonna be keyed off of that debug type that we saw earlier. And there's actually a bunch of kind of debugging prints already committed in the code base and this will print just those, which is pretty handy to have per pass debug info. So for instance, I had to debug something related to register allocation. And so I would turn on, I would run many multiple passes and run, uh, or dump multiple debug info passes. I'd say debug only greedy, debug only live interval, debug only um, I think spill placement kind of thing. And then, then you'd get kind of um, very interesting debug info that, that really shed light on you know, how do these passes work. I find those kind of interesting from understanding a pass from a runtime perspective. 
Also optimization remarks with the dash capital R pass flags are keyed off of those as well. So, um, but you know, it's hit or miss whether or not uh, these optimization remarks are emitted for any given pass. It can be helpful to, to add these for a pass if you're debugging and then just commit them because someone may need them in the future. You know, I find the ones for the inliner particularly helpful for whether or not the inliner decided to inline something. But actually a handful of flags that I use all the time for both opt and LLC. Um, print after all is really the workhorse is, you know, show me everything that, that happened after every pass. Um, print before all is just the flip side of that coin. Um, the, after all, the previous pass should be the same as the before all of the, the subsequent pass. Um, if you want to narrow it down to just one pass, you can say dash print after equals and then LICM, Hoopid Very Code Motion, or whatever your pass name is. Flip side of that coin is print before. Um, one of the things that I find useful is or interesting a little bit is stop after. A bit of a double-edged sword. So um, stop after will say stop running subsequent passes if I said O2. So you know it's more useful maybe for, for mirror um, tests for the back end where you're testing some pass in the middle and you don't really care about the output from the afterwards. Um, can speed up tests a slight amount, so it's kind of nice. You know, maybe it's more precise to just run the individual pass you need for opt, but a little harder to do that for LLC and, and mirror tests in general. Um, the flip side of the coin where it's a double-edged sword is that uh, it can be nice to have coverage of subsequent passes with those, with that input. Um, so, you know, you might be covering up a bug there or a compiler crash if you use stop after, but I don't know, I, I kind of like it. Um, print module scope is, is useful for um, LLVM when it, when it does transforms, will kind of do per function, you know, per basic block, um, per optimization passes. It, it doesn't do like per pass per module, um, which is a little tricky. And I find print module scope a little bit helpful sometimes in seeing um, like a per module per pass um, output instead. Um, and then debug pass equals arguments is helpful for seeing um, wh which passes actually got, got run, for instance. And what's interesting is if you invoke Clang, right, so I use these for opt and LLC, but if you just invoke Clang, if you prefix these with dash M LLVM as opposed to dash X Clang, uh, and then use one of these, you can actually get Clang to print this information as well, right? So if you're trying to figure out, you know, why is Clang's pipeline different from ops? Well, maybe dash, you'd invoke Clang, dash M, LLVM, dash print after all, and pipe that through grep for some of the past names. Oops. Right, so I kind of covered this a little bit, is mirror generally is a little less flexible, um, unfortunately, than LLVM IR, but print before, um, is is your friend. Uh, I, I find like when I'm running a mirror, if, if I need to debug a, a mirror, if I need to write a mirror test, I'll typically use print before and print the output of the pass before the one that I know the bug is in. And I'll start with that as kind of the input of my mirror test, um, which can be helpful since I generally find mirror tests to be pretty hard to write by hand since they can be pass specific. You can attach a debugger to LLVM. You're gonna probably wanna do a debug build so you have more debug info about kind of where you are um, and, and rebuild. Most objects have a dump method. Uh, kind of the caveat there is, you know, I find relinking a debug build even on my many core workstation to take quite a long time. Um, I find for my workflow, I can relink a release build and just do printf debugging a lot faster than, than using a debugger, but you know, uh, depending on your workflow, you may have really great muscle memory um, or really good plugins that, that you uh, use when debugging. So your mileage may vary there. Um, table gen, I'm not going to cover really in depth. There's some really good talks that I recommend on this. And, you know, there's extensive documentation, but really think of it as like um, kind of C++ templating taken to a whole new level. Um, one of the things that's interesting in the source code is you have these .td files where generally we kind of parse these records um, at build time of LLVM and generate .inc files, which are generally C++ source that gets pound included by the preprocessor into the C++ sources of LLVM itself, all during the build of LLVM. 
Um, you may see some of these pre-committed as def files as well, where you know there, there's kind of tricky cases why they, they can't be using table gen or they might be to use to convert them fully to table gen files kind of thing. Um, you know, here's an example though, is some of the diagnostics in Clang, right? So there's LLVM table gen and Clang table gen. Um, kind of depends where the TD file is, which one you you'll want to run. Um, but one of the things that's important to note is you're going to need to specify a generator. So um, to, to kind of find which generator you want to run, you, I've had luck looking at the CMake lists.txt file that's in the same directory as the TD file that I'm trying to you know, generate code for. And then typically you'll see a bunch of include or import errors. You just need to specify, you know, what other directory should it be looking in kind of thing. So it's common to say dash I, you know, LLVM include for instance. And for example, um, you know, this diagnostic TD file is only 152 lines, but after we expand it into C++, it expands to over 5,000 lines of C++ code. So, you know, that that's really kind of a nice example of, you know, it would have kind of sucked to have to write out that much C++ by hand. So table gen is pretty powerful in that sense, um, is, is leveraged quite highly in, in MLIR as well. Um, but debugging it is a whole other talk into itself. Uh, LVM lit as well. Um, Ninja check calls, which you'll use, let, let's say you get an email, build breakage. LVM lit is what you should be, uh, or Ninja check calls, which you should be using to run all unit tests. It's gonna run, um, you know, IR unit tests for the various IRs. It's gonna run um, the unit tests that are C++ based that are for more testing core class functionality in LLVM. It's gonna run Python bindings and stuff. Um, if you have a test failure, uh, LLVM lit dash VV, and then rerun the LL file test typically, or you know whatever the input test file is, will typically give you more information um, for where to go, what's going wrong. Um, one of the things that can be very tricky is some test files have multiple run lines, and it gets very tricky to tell which run line's failing if only one is failing. Um, so one of the things I find interesting is you know, if you make a copy of the test file and just delete the run lines that aren't failing, that can help you really like trim down the, the, the input test to really figure out what's going wrong there. Um, you know, again, the whole talk's worth on what you can do to, to debug LVM lit, but kind of go quick here. Um, for SEMA, working with SEMA in Clang, one of the things I find interesting is, you know, if I want to implement a new, um, if I want to implement a new compiler warning, I'll typically compile with dash w every, I'll write some code in godbolt.org um, that I know will produce a specific warning. I'll compile with dash w everything. I'll, I'll take the warning string and I'll kind of remove the, the, the source specific identifiers, um, imagining there's like a percent, like a, a, a format specifier in there. And I'll kind of grep Clang's code base for the generic part of that. Um, typically you'll find a, a def, some kind of record in a TD file for the warning itself, which will define, um, it'll define an identifier that's then used in the Clang source file for emitting a diagnostic specific to that warning. Um, and that will help you kind of find uh, where in Clang that warning is being emitted from. And that can help you either debug either a missed warning or a bug in a warning that's being emitted that shouldn't be. Um, but it's also really useful for understanding how warning, how to write your own warning. And there's a really great talk I recommend from Micah and, Demet and Dimitri on that as well. Um, and then I think one of the other things that the, kind of the final part of the talk that I think is most interesting, one thing I spend a lot of time doing is what's what we would call test case reduction. So like I mentioned earlier, my focus is building the Linux kernel with Clang and all of the LLVM utilities. We hit, uh, the Linux kernel exposes a lot of bugs in, in, in Clang and LLVM. And there's a lot of source code to chew through. So, you know, really what we want to do when we submit a bug report is really have a concise test case or reproducer. So test case reduction is really, really important. So in this case, you know, there's an example here where we implemented some new um, command line flag and, it and the compiler started crashing. So if you wanted to follow along, you could check out this version of LLVM and this version of the Linux kernel. Um, and I link here to all the code used throughout the rest of the, the kind of slides on this example here. But you can see like, this is how we would build a Linux kernel and specifically how we cross compile an ARC64 Linux kernel that would use this feature. 
Um, specifically, when we'd build a specific object file, the compiler would crash, right? So here's kind of my, my framework or playbook for how do I recommend debugging these kind of compiler crashes or anything you suspect is really compiler bug. So really the first thing we want to do is isolate the compiler invocation from the build environment. So, you know, LLVM is, you can kind of build it with CMake, uh, I guess configure it with CMake, build it with Ninja or Make. Um, but the Linux kernel uses GNU Make. Uh, I guess there's GN is, is used as well in LLVM. And so what would really be nice as a starting point is really to kind of, we don't really care for our bug reports, you know, the make invocation or the CMake invocation. Instead, we really want just how did you invoke Clang, right? So you want to kind of figure out that from your build environment. Typically, they'll have a way of printing verbose information of, you know, what's everything they're doing. We want to confirm that we have that right. Maybe that's obvious. Um, create a reproducer script. So we'll see later some tools where they actually take, you know, input source and a shell script as two files as input. And they'll re, re, they'll do some modification to the input and rerun the, the, the shell script to tell if it's interesting or not. So if you ever run git bisect in an automated fashion, you know, there's other tools that work similar to that that we'll get to. Um, generally, I find a lot of these tools though are, um, they wanna copy your source file around to like temporary directories. And so if you have command line, in, command line flags that are, um, relative paths, a lot of the tools are gonna to choke on that. So, and, and most of those are involved with telling the preprocessor where to look for things in relative paths there. So I find if you preprocess your input, generally the tools will work better. I always recommend doing that. From there, I use Creduce a lot, a lot, and we'll see what those tools do. Um, if you have tons of command line flags that can be useful, probably not all of them are relevant to chop those down. Fortunately, no real automated way to do that quite yet that I know of at least. Um, from there, we want to generate LLVMIR potentially if it's a bug in the in the middle end or back end. Um, otherwise, C input for front end bugs. Um, and there's some tools. You know, I, I covered how to dump LLVMIR, but there's some other interesting utilities we'll cover. Um, and then finally, if we have a lot of LLVMIR, maybe not all of it is interesting for reproducing. Excuse me, the bug. So we'll see some some test case reduction techniques there. So. Um, for instance, for Linux kernel, for GNU make, if you say capital V equals one, that'll print everything out. Um, that's how we can get our compiler invocation. But also for the case of compiler crashes, client will typically produce that kind of stack trace, which is nice. So we could get it either way there. Um, if I, you know, rerun whatever the compiler invocation was in the command line, I can confirm that that's, you know, exactly what was being run to cause the compiler to crash. Um, a reproducer script. Um, so again, all these are tricky. They're all gonna look unique based on what you're debugging kind of thing. But if you see a crash for a function that looks interesting, you know, maybe you wanna run your compiler, you wanna redirect std error to std out, capture the output and then grep it for um, the stack trace, right? And, and kind of some of these automated tools will pare down the input and then keep running your shell script um, to see in, in stop when um, they no longer see this in the output, for instance. So um, stack traces, you'll wanna be very specific on the, the methods in, in the trace. If you just say stop iterating what, um, based on the return code, typically you'll get a reduction, a test case reduction. Hey Dash, this is my kitty Dash. Here's gonna help us with the talk. Um, if you just say stop the reduction, um, on the return code, you'll typically get uh, no output. It'll reduce to nothing. Um, directory independent is also tricky. Get rid of those dash i flags. Um, you can fix them by preprocessing. Um, and uh, you may need to redirect your output and uh, careful of, of the return codes kind of thing. So preprocessor dash e. Um, so C reduce, one of my favorite tools. Uh, you can give it kind of the number of cores you want it to run with, the shell script you want it to run, and then pre-processed output. Um, so you can see uh, we went from, in our case, thousands of lines down to five lines of code, right? So here's our reproducer. Little ugly because the, the return type is, is left off here. Um, there's some implicits 
for C implicit defaults. But um, CVice is a, a newer tool that that tries to improve the concurrency. So so I recommend take a look at that. This is a, maybe a substitute for C reduce. Um, these were all the command line flags in the build, but actually we only needed like three or four of these to reproduce the problem. So pretty helpful for bug report. Um, and then dumping LLVM IR, since this was a bug in the back end, um, O2 dash S dash emit LLVM, no dash X clang dash uh, disable LLVM passes since it was a bug in the back end. And ultimately we wind up with um, 20 lines of output Another tool that I've used in the past successfully, very helpful, LVM extract. You give it a function you want in an output file and it will take your input. If you have a lot of LVM IR and it will recursively pull out the function definition and then all of the definitions that it depends on, which is really nice. Um, you could go straight from C code right to, <laughs> come here Dash. Um, you can go right from, from C code directly to LVM IR with LVM extract. Um, it's just a matter of, you know, is it helpful to, to C reduce first or um, try to reduce the, L the LLVM IR kind of thing. LLVM reduce is a newer tool, newer than, than bug point that you can use. Same thing, you give it, you know, a shell script that whether or not it's interest, whether the output's interesting and it will reduce your LLVM IR. So this cuts it down by another, you know, five lines of IR. Um, here's kind of our output here. Um, you know, finally, bug point is kind of the original that you can use here. I generally prefer LLVM reduce when I can get it to work and not crash. I generally find that it crashes for for large output, uh, large inputs of LLVM. Um, so your mileage may vary. Um, there's a great blog post that's really helpful here on how to how to use it. Works really great for comp for any crash in LLVM. Actually, the only thing I really dislike about it is whether or not it should continue iterating. Um, the return code is flipped from all other utilities in existence. So um, just something to be aware of uh, when, when running bug point, right? So, you know, bug point was able to actually reduce things even further. But if I was going to, this is a great starting point for a bug report or a test case, but, you know, there's still kind of <laughs> further things um, that we could remove here to, uh, sorry, Kitty. Further things that we could reduce here uh, for a test case, right? So, you know, the target specific stuff is maybe not, not as important, maybe um, kind of thing. So um, one of the things that's tricky though, if you start cutting things out is make sure to run op dash verify so you don't end up generating a uh, invalid test case kind of thing. And finally, if, if you have questions, don't hesitate to ask. Um, so kind of more additional resources where you can find more information as the various mail, various mailing lists, CFE dev for the Clang front end, LLVM dev are the two I rely on most. Um, IRC, uh, there's a Discord server, file bugs in the bug tracker. Uh, the subreddit is pretty is pretty active. The LLVM blog and LLVM weekly are my two favorite places for LLVM news. And finally, there's a lot of great talks on YouTube. So there's both the LLVM channel and actually Fosdom uh, has really, really great both live recordings and streams during the conference as well. So, um, you know, anything I mentioned here today, you probably can find out more if it interests you in one of these. And, and really don't hesitate to ask questions and ask for help. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you with this parting thought, but I think it's, it's, uh, it, it's something very important for, for newbies to internalize is, um, you know, anyone who seems knowledgeable in these things obviously didn't start that way. So, um, really read through test cases is super helpful and, and rely on your resources and ask for help. So thank you very much for your time. That's, that's everything for the talk. And I guess I'll take questions now. Thanks. Thanks for our speaker, Nick. Uh, the Sonius for sharing everything he knows about debugging LVN to us. And Nick is one of the Linux kernel maintainers for LVN support. He's now waiting online for your questions. So please feel free to put your question in a session Q&A and let us move on the first question. 
So uh, in the question list, I see uh, people are asking if we can have the slides available. Nick, uh, may you help to answer this one? Yeah, so the slides are available. Um, maybe the easiest way to find them real quick is uh, I, I have them already up on GitHub. You can go to clangbuiltlinux.github.io to find more about the project that, that I work on. Um, and linked from there are all the repositories of, of different kind of projects. And from there, you can find uh, the, the latest version of the slides kind of thing. And, and please feel free to file an issue in GitHub on the slides for anything, any tips that you have, any ways I could refine the talk um, and improve them. So. Nice. So uh, let me see. The second question I see is, uh, People are thinking this uh, talk is a treasure trove. So are there any plans to make a write-up for this? I'd love to do that. Uh, I think uh, one question I always have in my mind is, uh, you know, does this information kind of bit rot over time kind of thing? So I think, you know, if, if folks have ideas on, you know, what, what, are, what format would be appropriate so that we could keep it as more of a living document, I think that, that would be interesting kind of thing to me. You know, is a blog post as appropriate? Well, if it if it if the information decays over time, maybe less so. So I don't know. I, I look forward to feedback on that. Cool. And uh, next question coming up is: uh, Are there any LVN specific diff tools to compare to IR dumps? Yeah. So there's a, a utility in the tree called LLVM diff that's a slightly nicer than um, like if, if you're just using the command line diff. So command line diff, I always use diff dash u to get the kind of almost like Git um, format of, of the difference between two files. But one of the things that can be tricky is comparing two different IR dumps um, is that a lot of the, the debug information or metadata can have changed subtly. And then that will cause like every single line, like you could have two IR sources that are practically the same, but all of the, the metadata is off by one, which will cause every line to, to, to look different, right? So LLVM def is a little bit smarter about um, like having knowledge of the input language and, and um, kind of uh, cleaning up the output a little bit. So it makes it a little bit easier to follow. So check, check that out. And the next one is uh, actually from the chat window. People are asking about when I try building debug and parallel make, he has noticed that uh, it usually needs a lot of memory. Is there a solution for this to have less threads or there's another flag for building the LVM? So there was a, a pretty cool tip actually in, in the session chat. Uh, apparently there's some CMake options that are specific to LLVM. There's a dash D LLVM parallel compile jobs, dash D parallel link jobs that, that you can set to, to try to reduce those. Um, generally, when I'm when I'm building things, even on on my workstation during the day, I'll always try to limit the number of of threads or concurrent tasks to be at least one less than the number of of uh, kind of virtual cores or threads that my system supports, just to keep things a little bit more responsive. Um, and just in in my past experience, I have had issues where if I do use like make dash j to say like you know create as many child tasks as there are cores. Um, I've definitely run into cases where it exhausts memory on my machine, you know, for some reason kind of thing. So uh, always limiting the, the, the concurrency to be one less than the number of cores. Uh, when you have a lot to spare, it can, can sometimes be helpful. And the other one is uh, my, related to your Linux uh, experience as well. Uh, people are asking, what's the IDE you would recommend for ease of debugging LVN source code on Linux platforms? So I, I'm a, a huge fan, uh, it, not quite an IDE, but you can build it up over time. You know, I, I use Vim a lot with a lot of plugins. In particular, uh, LLVM in Tree actually has quite a few, like they'll have language definition files that you can use both for Emacs or LLVM, um, you know, things to help you um, syntax highlight the language correctly. Uh, but Visual Studio Code is, is I think, pretty great in, in, in my experience. I've been happy with that. Um, as long as you do kind of outer tree build, so it doesn't try to index your your build artifacts, I think it generally works better. But you know, I, I've been I've been using Vim. I'm pretty happy with it. I think C tags with Vim is a great combination. Um, but then I'll use kind of code search uh, utilities that we have for kind of jumping back and forth between you know 
where this method that's being called, where is it defined? So I can go look at, you know, what is it doing? Um, but then also to see like, okay, well, who else calls it? Because, you know, maybe I want to use it or see if I can reuse it for a problem. Um, but I'm not sure precisely like how do the inputs get calculated or created kind of thing. Um, so I, I'll generally use kind of external um, code index utilities that are more web-based kind of thing. Well, the next question is, uh, what's a good resource for learning how to write test cases for individual LVM passes, the faces? I think, I think the, the best thing for learning about specific passes, um, like one of the things that, that I find that I do often is, so like one of the plugins I use in Vim is, is uh, Vim Fugitive, which is just like a little shortcut for the same information that's displayed otherwise in Git Blame. Um, so the idea is like, let, let's say you're looking at a pass and um, there, there's some case where like you think there may be the bug here or, you know, there's some, some edge case that's being handled and you, you want to learn more about it. I find if you take a look at the git blame for whoever kind of added um, maybe some of the code in the pass and, and take a look at what test cases were added in the commit that modified the, the sources of LLVM itself. Um, I, you know, I always think taking a look at the existing tests for that, that pass are helpful. Um, let's say, you know, in, in my talk, I use loop invariant code motion, right? So, you know, I might CD into LLVM slash test and then grep for um, dash LICM. And I'll see, you know, what existing test cases are there that, that invoke LICM and, and test that. So, you know, those are kind of two of my tips I recommend um, for, for, you know, see, I, you, you can learn a lot from, from observing existing things, I think. The next one is, uh, the next question is, uh, have you ever been successful using GDB on Mac OS Catalina? Or do you know a debugger that works with Eclipse, which does not seem to support LDB? Uh, it, it's definitely been a while since I've, I've used Mac OS. Uh, you'll see on my blog, actually, some pretty old posts that, that do talk a lot about Mac OS um, kind of thing. Um, so, uh, I, I haven't run GDB versus kind of LLDB on, on Mac OS in a while. And unfortunately I haven't used Eclipse. So sorry, I, I, don't, I don't know. Okay, next one. Uh, uh, so there's in chat somebody, I'm not sure uh, which, what is the TD file format? So may you highlight it again? Yeah, so the TD is, is t uh, table gen, uh, is kind of the, the rule-based language that, that's reminiscent of C++ um, template programming. Um, so the, the TD files are kind of the inputs and then generally they generate um, an ink or a .def file um, in the tree. And then, you know, there's also helpful utilities for your favorite editor in tree that define the language within table gen that, that way you can get kind of nice uh, language highlighting features for table gen as well. And the next one is, I think it's related to Go question, uh, Go code, but I guess people have no directly um, a screenshot to see what the code is. And I think Nick, you already answered this question online, right? And in yeah, I think, um, I, I, I don't know too much about the Go runtime, if it's possible to attach a debugger to it. I assume it is kind of thing, but I think just generally one of the things that, that can be helpful is taking the time um, for any, anytime you're debugging an object in memory, uh, it's nice to have like a pretty print kind of format for it. And that's really what the dump method comes in handy in LLVM. And that's a common recurring pattern on, on many commonly used classes in, in LLVM. And so if you're trying to debug something, you know, always try to see if there is a dump method, if you can call it. And if there's not, it might be helpful for you and further um, developers if, if you were to implement your own. Um, and, and, you know, that way within a debugger or even just you know, printing the output of it kind of thing might be helpful. Nice. And uh, next question is also related to TD files. How to debug some build error in TD file? The error mm -hmm. message is very weird and difficult to understand. From yeah, so I, I, you know, as if templates weren't hard enough <laughs> kind of thing, um, you know, I, I can definitely empathize, uh, uh, you know, with, with table gen, I think, um, the difficulty in, in debugging it sometimes. Uh, I'm going to have to refer you to, to some of the other talks that I linked to on, on table gen kind of thing. Um, it, 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 it's definitely not 
definitely not easy. I think one of the things is is really try to take a look at the definition of a of a rule, and and try to see what parameters it expects. Because um, I think and and from there try to understand what do um, existing like how do existing rules make use of those definitions, um, and you know try to try to see from there maybe if there's something that that you have misplaced kind of thing can can lead to you know. Parser is not as helpful as Clang in, in pinpointing precisely where you made a small mistake. And, you know, myself, I'm certainly guilty of, uh, I find it very difficult if I have like one character that's wrong, um, you know, maybe having someone else take a look at it with you can, uh, you know, I, I have trouble spotting off by one kind of character issues in, in my code sometimes. Okay, uh, next one is how to debug bad machine code from machine verifier. It shows all the irrelevant arrows when only one of it hits the actual arrow. So yeah, we we actually I actually ran the machine verifier yesterday and was actually adding some passes to it. And so you know I I literally saw exactly this yesterday. And um, I think the idea is is really you know take take the error string, grep for it in the code base, see where it's getting printed, and then from there you can manually add just additional print statements, right? So one of the things that's super helpful is like earlier when I showed um, the mod, the class hierarchy where in LLVM you have modules, functions, basic blocks, instructions, there's always typically these, um, these parent, uh, there's a method called parent. So you, from an instruction, if you call its parent, you can get the function, uh, sorry, the basic block, the parent of the basic block is the function, the parent of the, uh, function is the module. And so one of the things that might be helpful is, let's say you have a machine operand error, right, is, well, uh, is to try to print the higher up hierarchy of like the machine basic block, for instance, is, you know, it, it can be helpful to get kind of more context where the error messages generally are terser, but I find if you go in and then, you know, kind of sprinkle a little bit more information and rebuild LLVM, it can be helpful. Oh, I think we have time for one more question. So if you have any tips for debugging LVM with GDB in general? Mm -hmm. um, so I think beyond what was in my talk, um, I think one of the things that, that I found pretty helpful sometimes with GDB is the ability to script it. Um, and so uh, it, if you find yourself rerunning the debugger often kind of thing, uh, it can be helpful to like there, there is a Python interpreter supported, so it can be helpful to, um, you know, try to speed up your workflow. If you find yourself repeating it often kind of thing. Um, other than that, I think, uh, most of my, most of my work with GDB is actually attaching it to QEMU and debugging a, a Linux kernel that's running under emulation kind of thing, less so with, uh, with LLVM itself, so. Cool, thanks a lot for every questions and the answers. So mm -hmm. uh, it's going to be the end of the session. So please feel free everybody to leave questions in the community for, uh, in Uva app. So Nick can help to answer more, <laughs> but we thank you all for joining and thanks our speaker. Have a nice day to you all. Thanks. Thank you, Linya, and thank you everyone for attending. I hope you find it uh, valuable.